As the police officers across the interview table from 15-year-old James Denovan continued to ask him about the newspaper cutting that had been found in his wallet, following him being arrested and charged with indecency in August 1960, he began to break down, knowing he was going to have to come clean, knowing he was going to have to give evidence against his friend. As he contemplated the repercussions to what he was about to do, he smiled to himself, thinking that while the police thought they only had him for indecency, they in fact were about to see a recent murder be solved. As James Denovan got ready to tell officers just what had transpired on the night of the 6th of April 1960, he thought back to a year earlier, where it had all began. It was early 1959 when 15-year-old James Douglas Denovan and his friend, 18-year-old Anthony Joseph Miller, who both lived near Queen's Park Recreation Ground, which according to Wikipedia is a 148-acre park situated about 2.5 miles or 4 kilometres south of Glasgow city centre, first came up with the idea of making extra money. At the time, James Denovan lived in Calder Street with his respectable family, with his father being a shop manager and Anthony Miller lived in Dixon Street with his hard-working parents and younger brother, with his father being employed as a seaman and often being away from home. Anthony had been an apprentice cabinet maker, but had then gained employment, along with James Denovan, with a removal firm. Neither of them had ever been in trouble with the police and would, according to the Glasgow Times on the 15th of November 2020, regularly spend their time hanging out with other teenagers at a cafe near their homes, where they would chat up girls and listen to music on the jukebox. It was in this very cafe where James and Anthony came up with the idea where they would become partners in crime in order to make what they thought would be easy money. It was due to the pair living so close to Queen's Park Recreation Ground and what it was known for back in the 50s and 60s that would aid the pair's money-making plan. According to an article in the BBC News in July 2017, homosexuality among men was illegal in Scotland until 1980, despite England and Wales partially decriminalising homosexuality in July 1967, 13 years prior, with historian Dr Gail Davis saying in the same BBC article that the delay in Scottish law finally coming into line with England and Wales was due to it being argued that Scotland had a more lenient approach to homosexuality and that it was more difficult to actually be prosecuted for homosexuality in Scotland, and so there was no need to interfere with the law, and it was best just to leave it alone. Perhaps if a change in law had come much sooner, then James Denovan and Anthony Miller would not have been able to, for over a year, target homosexual men who would meet in Queen's Park at night for illegal sex. A year before the body of 48-year-old John Kremen was found in Queen's Park Recreation Ground, initially presumed to have fallen while drunk, James Denovan, who, according to an article in Glasgow Live in June 2020, was described as being a pretty boy, would tempt men who he would encounter in the toilets in Queen's Park and suggest they go to nearby wooded areas of the park, where, of course, Anthony Miller would be lying in wait, usually pretending to be drunk and therefore deemed harmless. However, before the lured men knew what was happening, James Denovan and Anthony Miller would pounce on their victims and rifle through their pockets for any money and valuables, using violence if necessary. The pair used the fact that homosexuality was illegal and their victims were unlikely to go to the police about being robbed and beaten up for fear of being exposed as being gay and being charged themselves. And James and Anthony were right, which is why they were able to continue their robbery scam for over a year and were not even deterred when on the 6th of April 1960 their scam went horribly wrong. Sadly, there is very little known about 48-year-old John Kremen, other than, according to an article in Glasgow Live, he was a local hard man and thief who, on the 6th of April 1960, was caught up in James Denovan and Anthony Miller's scam ending in his murder. Like I said, when John Kremen's body was initially discovered the next day by a dog walker, it was believed he was drunk and had simply fallen. It wouldn't be until a post-mortem was carried out and the cap he had been wearing was then removed that his severe head injuries were revealed, with the post-mortem stating that John had died from massive head injuries, at which point a murder investigation was launched, the first job being to find out who this man was, as he had no wallet or identification on him. And so two days after John's body had been found, an appeal was made for anyone to come forward if they recognised this man's description. 
It's not known if anyone came forward who recognised the description of John Kremen as being their loved one, but the reporting at the time stated that he was of no fixed abode and suggested that he likely had not been missed by anyone, his identity only being discovered upon James Denovan being arrested in Queen's Park in August 1960 on unrelated indecency charges and upon detectives going through his wallet and finding the very same newspaper article appealing for relatives of the man found murdered at Queen's Park Recreation Ground to come forward and finding this suspicious had confronted James Denovan who eventually broke down and told detectives just who this man was and what had happened to him. Now, while some newspapers reported that the reason John Kremen had been killed, when others who had found themselves in the same situation as him in the previous year had not, was because, him being a hard man, he had fought back when the pair had tried to rob him. However, when James Denovan told his side of the story, a very different picture emerged, but which account was to be believed? Upon James Denovan breaking down after being arrested on an unrelated indecency offence, he went on to tell detectives that on the night of John Kremen's murder, he had met him in the toilets at Queen's Park Recreation Ground, as he had done time and time again for over a year, and he had led him to a secluded wooded area, where he said his 18-year-old friend, Anthony Miller, was waiting as per their usual plan, pretending to be drunk. However, unlike the other occasions the pair had pulled this robbery scam, James went on to say, according to an article in the Birmingham Daily Post in November 1960, that just as he and John walked past Anthony Miller, who was pretending to be drunk, and James Denneman had uttered the words, never mind him, he's drunk, he said that he saw out of the corner of his eye Anthony Miller pick up a piece of wood and hit John Kremen over the head with it, with John falling straight onto his face. According to the same article, James Denovan went on to say that he then took John's watch from his wrist while Anthony Miller took John's penknife from his pocket and began to slash at John's coat, trying to get any money he had in the pockets out. However, they were unable to, and so they both rolled John onto his back and removed money amounting to £67, which in today's money would be about £1,280 and $1,600 from his trouser pockets, as well as his bank book before they then turned and left, leaving John there to die. Whether John did fight back or was attacked before he had a chance to, or whether he did or didn't leave behind a family who loved him, doesn't change the fact that he was murdered. 19-year-old Anthony Joseph Miller and 16-year-old James Douglas Denovan were both arrested and charged with the robbery and murder of 48-year-old John Kremen and they appeared at Glasgow Sheriff Court on the 4th of November 1960, seven months after John Kremen had been murdered, where they pleaded not guilty to the charge. A trial date was set for the 14th of November 1960, where Anthony Miller faced a death sentence for capital murder, while James Denovan faced a life sentence for non-capital murder. The difference in sentences was simply because of their ages. At 19, Anthony Miller was legally an adult. Anthony Miller and his devastated family had already been advised of this fact by Anthony's counsel, 27-year-old Len Murray, who, despite having only been a fully qualified lawyer for three years, had already had a capital murder client, where he had explained that, despite Anthony's young age, because of the Homicide Act 1957, which stated that if a murder takes place during the course of a robbery, the perpetrator will face a death penalty, Anthony, being only 19 years old and being a first-time offender, made no difference, and he was automatically eligible for the death sentence. Shocked by this, Anthony and his family now could only hope that the jury returned a not guilty verdict for murder. No doubt at this point, the seriousness of their situation may have begun to sink in, as detectives discovered following speaking with witnesses that the murder of John Kremen certainly hadn't appeared to have affected either boy before they were arrested, with some witnesses saying, according to an article in the Glasgow Times in November 2020, the very night after John Kremen had been murdered, the pair had apparently gone to the cinema to see the film Tommy the Torridor, which is a British musical comedy, followed by splashing out £5, which in today's money would be about £93 or $118 of the money stolen from John on drinks, before apparently then lighting a cigarette using one of the stolen notes from John. Also, the fact that their latest robbery victim had been killed did not deter the pair, as they continued to target and rob homosexual men for months, 
right up until James Denevan was arrested for indecency and he finally confessed to his part in the murder of John Kremen. The fact at least James Denevan had clearly shown no remorse following the murder of John Kremen was further revealed when, upon another witness being questioned by the police, they said, according to an article in the Scotsman on the 17th of November 1960, that apparently he had taken another boy to the place where John Kremen's murder had occurred and called for a two-minute silence for the man who had flaked it, shortly before the post-mortem revealed that John had in fact been murdered and had not simply fallen whilst drunk. When the trial at the High Court in Glasgow began on Monday the 14th of November 1960, the pair now faced further charges of assault and robbery, as brave homosexual men had come forward to admit that they too had been victims of the pair's robbery scam in Queen's Park Recreation Ground throughout 1959 and 1960. Both Anthony Miller and James Denevin pleaded guilty to these charges, but continued to plead not guilty to the charge of murder, and the trial began. While Anthony Miller did not take to the stand throughout the three-day trial, James Denevin did. He was asked what his part had been in the scam of robbing homosexual men in Queen's Park, to which he replied, According to an article in the Birmingham Daily Post in November 1960, I was used as a decoy to attract these men out to some place where there was nobody around. Going on to say that Miller would get hold of them and go through their pockets, and then we would rob them. Usually Miller threatened them. There was never any violence used first. He was then asked by his counsel specifically about the night John Kremen had been murdered asking if it had been part of the arrangement that Anthony Miller would strike John over the head with a bit of wood, to which James Denevin replied, no, that was not arranged, suggesting that this part of the plan had been carried out completely independently by Anthony Miller. James Denevin then left the stand. At the end of the third day, the 16th of November 1960, the advocate deputy and both defence counsels summed up to the jury, followed by Judge Lord Wheatley, who, according to an article in the Scotsman on the 17th of November 1960, said of the capital and non-capital charges against both boys, there may be, very naturally, at the back of your mind, the consequences of a finding of guilt on such a charge, and that consciousness may not be lessened by reason of the fact that the accused are only boys, who were only 18 and 15 years of age, respectively, when the crime is alleged to have been committed. But on the other hand, there is a background of vice, depravity and violence, which may have shocked and astonished you. It would be wrong of you to allow sympathy to overcome judgment and reason. He went on to say that if the jury believed the evidence presented, then I direct you in law, there is no room for culpable homicide at all in that situation. It was murder. He also went on to warn the jury regarding James Denevin's evidence, saying that there was also the danger that he could have told the story that it had been Anthony Miller who had hit John Kremen over the head with a piece of wood, which in turn excused himself, only implicating Anthony Miller, but went on to say, subject to this warning, you can still believe him if you're so minded. The jury then retired for 33 minutes before returning to convict both boys. 16-year-old James Douglas Denevin was found guilty of non-capital murder and sentenced to life in prison, and 19-year-old Anthony James Miller was found guilty of capital murder, at which point the judge donned the black cap and sentenced Anthony Miller to be hanged on the 7th of December between 8 and 10 a.m. The female jury members wept as Anthony was condemned to death. The pair were then led away, James Denevin being sent to Greenock Prison to begin his life sentence, and Anthony Miller to the condemned cell at Berlini Prison to await his fate. But the 7th of December, the execution day, came and went, and Anthony Miller still sat in his cell. Upon Anthony Miller's sentence being passed, his parents, Marie and Alf, alongside volunteers, immediately began to campaign to have it reduced to one of life imprisonment, erecting a stall in Glasgow city centre where they stood in the rain and freezing cold and eventually amassed more than 30,000 signatures. And with the help of Anthony's lawyer at the trial, Len Murray, this petition was sent to the Scottish Court of Criminal Appeal, as well as appealing on the grounds, according to the Scotsman on November 1960, that Judge Lord Wheatley failed to direct the jury that it was open to them to return a verdict of culpable homicide, and that instead he had directed the jury that they were in fact not entitled to return such a verdict. 
However, the appeal was dismissed by three judges who said, according to the Scotsman in December 1960, that the appeal was completely devoid of substance and that they were astonished that such an allegation was made. At this point, a new execution date was set for the 22nd of December 1960. Anthony's lawyer, Len Murray, told of his anger towards the three judges in an interview with the Daily Record in 2010, where he said, This was a capital case. A boy's life was at stake, but we were made to feel that it was impertinence to bring that case into the appeals court. Anthony's family and lawyer refused to give up, though, and the petition was sent to the then Secretary of State for Scotland, seeking a reprieve for Anthony Miller. However, on the 19th of December, this was also rejected. All anyone could do now was wait for the execution day, three days before Christmas. The day before the execution was due to take place, Anthony's mum, Marie, sitting in her living room, spoke to the Daily Record newspaper, where she said, Now is the end of everything for Tony and me. He used to bring stray cats and dogs into the house, once an injured bird. Violence was alien to him, but what's done cannot be undone. I will never remember him as a killer. Anthony's dad, Alf, was said to have been heartbroken. Many years later, Anthony's lawyer, Len Murray, told the Daily Record newspaper, I could not believe what was happening. They were actually going to hang the boy. Here we were in the latter part of the 20th century in a civilised community which was going to hang a 19-year-old boy. Interestingly, up until this case, Len had been strongly in favour of capital punishment, despite many in the UK calling for the abolition of capital punishment. But upon hearing Anthony Miller receive the death sentence, his views immediately changed, becoming a confirmed abolitionist from then on and he began an uphill fight to save Anthony Miller's life. But what was it about this case that changed his views? Anthony had murdered John Kremen. Didn't he deserve to be brought to justice for that? No, that's not what Len was saying, stating in an article in The Scotsman in May 2017 that, while there was little doubt Anthony Miller was guilty of killing John Kremen, Len believed that the punishment did not fit the circumstances of the crime saying in another article in The Scotsman in 2015 that most judges would have given a jury the option of bringing in a verdict of culpable homicide had they wanted. That would have been one way for the jury to avoid returning a capital verdict. Going on to say, though, that Lord Wheatley was never a judge for soft options. Len Murray did go on to state in the Daily Record in December 2010 exactly why, from the day Anthony Miller was sentenced to death, he was against the death penalty, saying, I saw firsthand the appalling hurt it caused perfectly innocent people. I saw what effect the sentence of death on Tony had upon his mother and father. No society has the right to inflict that never-ending torment upon innocent people. Those poor souls would carry that loss for the rest of their lives. That memory would never ever be erased from their minds. A punishment far greater than any other that man could ever possibly devise was being handed out to two innocent individuals, the parents of the condemned boy. Len Murray continued to work as a criminal lawyer in Scotland until 2003 when he retired as an acclaimed lawyer in Scotland. Throughout his 60 years as a lawyer, Len had many clients, including the likes of Billy Connolly and Paul McCartney, and he admitted that over time he had forgotten about many cases, However, despite the passage of time, he said in an article in the Glasgow Times that there was never any chance that I would forget about Tony Miller. Going on to talk about his views on the death penalty in an article in the Daily Record, saying, To those who say it is a deterrent, I say it is not. I have never seen any evidence from any country in the world that shows capital punishment is a deterrent. Len never missed an opportunity to share his views on the death penalty or to share Anthony Joseph Miller's story when he did interviews or talks, and he also included Anthony's story in his autobiography, The Pleader. Anthony Miller's case took an emotional toll on Len, and he never again took a capital punishment case. It was Thursday the 22nd of December 1960, just before 8am, and 19-year-old Anthony Joseph Miller was led from the condemned cell in Berlini Prison in Glasgow, to what was known as the Hanging Shed, where, at 8am precisely, a black cloth hood was placed over his head and a noose was placed around his neck. 
Anthony Miller is said to have uttered the words, Please, mister, before the trap door was released and he fell to his death at 8.02am. As Anthony Miller's body fell through the trap door, ending his life, three men stood outside Berlini prison, two of whom had simply been passing and had stopped as a matter of interest, and the third man, Bob MacDonald, said, according to the Coventry Evening Telegraph, on the 22nd of December 1960, and the Glasgow Times in 2017, that he was keenly interested in criminal trials and was against capital punishment, but did believe that in Anthony Miller's case it was justified. Whatever people felt about Anthony Miller being sentenced to death by hanging, his case will forever be known as the case that helped herald the end of capital punishment in the UK, with Anthony Miller being the last person to be hanged on the gallows of Glasgow's Berlini prison, and the second last person to be hanged in Scotland, with the last person being Henry Burnett for murdering Tommy Guyon in Aberdeen in 1963, before capital punishment for murder in the UK was suspended in 1965, before being abolished in the UK in 1969. According to an article in The Scotsman in November 2015, a total of 33 men and one woman were hanged in Scotland in the 20th century. Anthony Miller's story lived on in a theatre play in 2010 called Please, Mister, which depicted his last days in the condemned cell, followed by a television movie, Please, Mister, the Tony Miller's Story, which was released in 2012 and also depicted Anthony Miller's story.